coming to you live from the United States and Meaningful Minute. I'm Moshe Sharman and this is Contemporary Questions, Real Questions, Real Answers on Contemporary Topics with Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg. Discussing burning questions. If you have a good question, something that's been on your mind, drop it down in the question box right here. And we will be able to have the opportunity to pose to Goldberg, who needs no introduction. And we are waiting for him to join. But in the meantime, drop it in. This is important. Hello, Rabbi Goldberg. Hello, hello. A good night of Shabbos to you. Good night of Shabbos. Last night of Shabbos of the year. That's it, 100%. It's good to be together again. Amazing. So everyone, put the questions in the question box, not in the comments, because I'm talking to Rabbi Goldberg. I'm focused. I'm not looking at the comments. But look, put it in the question I'm box, Mark. I can say nice things in okay, the comments. Okay, okay. <laughs> put it in the question box. Put it in the comments. Keep it. Send it. Up to you. Um, Rabbi Goldberg, how was, uh, how was your past week? Do you have, do you have like... Um, different weeks like some weeks are good some weeks aren't as good every day every hour when you're in the rabbinate is different you never know what it's going to bring especially this time of year it's what i love about the job the avoda this profession it's a gift and a privilege and a pleasure so every week is different baruch hashem was a great week it's good to be back together again how about you i saw you started school yeah so the semester started on monday happens to be i'm now using anytime i meet a student from florida I'm like, oh, do you know uh, Rabbi Goldberg from South Florida? Fastest growing shul in America. Check it out. Thursday night, I'm uh, having a live. <laughs> so give me uh, credit. We're meeting students. It's, it's going great. Amazing. Great. Um, so, okay. So the first question, this was pre-submitted. We have a whole bunch of uh, coming in on the question box. Keep them coming. We're going to get to them, hopefully, time permitting. Um, but the first question was pre-submitted. So, it's a, it's, a, it's a big one. To date, 10 of my friends have gotten divorced, and I'm seeing an alarming uptick in other communities as well. I'm concerned about this. I'm wondering if the Rav has any, any perspective on this matter. Yeah, there definitely is an uptick in divorce in the world at large, and whatever exists in the world at large makes its way into the Torah community as well. We're not immune from it. And it's important to know that, because I think sometimes people... Uh, live in this cocoon and live this illusion that we are immune. If only we embrace Torah and a Torah way of life, then what's happening around us won't impact us. But of course it does. And it does impact us. Now, divorce is a mitzvah in the Torah. It's not a mitzvah chiyuvis. It's not like hearing the shofar that you have to go out and do it. Um, but it means that our religion's perspective and attitude is that divorce is not categorically bad or we don't reject it and we don't force people to stay married who aren't meant to be married. There are circumstances where there are irreconcilable differences, people have grown in different directions. Halacha talks about certain situations where a couple is no longer allowed to even be married together. So divorce, it's not, again, it's not like lulav and esrog or sukkah or shofar. You're not obligated to go out and get divorced. But if the circumstances are such that a person should be divorced, it is a mitzvah. Our religion understands it, recognizes that, and doesn't force people to be together who shouldn't. That said, Chazal tell us that the Mizbeach, the altar itself cries tears every time a marriage is dissolved. A marriage is a home, a marriage is continuity, a marriage, ish and isha, the name man and woman, when they have harmony, they have yud and hey of God's name. When they don't have harmony, ish ochlad, all they have the aisle from the shin is ish, is fire. Not the kind of fire like everyone on Instagram apparently puts on posts that they like, but the kind of fire that consumes and destroys and the kind of fire which is bad. So... Um, you know, on the one hand, we recognize divorce. It's not a concession. There are times that divorce is, in fact, the ideal for that circumstance. But divorce is tragic, no matter how you cut it. And there's a sense of mourning and grieving. People who go through divorce go through the stages of grief and the stages of mourning. Um, there's been an increase in a spike in divorce during Corona, during COVID. And that's, I think, a terrible idea. We should not make life-altering decisions in a pandemic where our lives and our worlds have been turned upside down. We're living in lockdown and we're living in unusual way and circumstances. It's not a time to make enormous life altering decisions. So um, marriages need work. They need selflessness. They need giving. The Torah Judaism has a very strong and, and a very clear philosophy that love is not the result of receiving getting. Everyone knows Rav Dessler's Kuntras HaChesed. Maybe everybody does it, doesn't it? Things I know, it's famous because I happen to know it. So I say <laughs> But Rav Desla wrote a, a great Kuntras where he talked about really the opposite of, um, 
of what people think. People think that, you know, if you give me and I receive from you, I'll love you. I'll love you because you gave me. But it's the opposite. Love doesn't come from getting. Love comes from giving. When I give, I build a bridge. I invest a piece of myself in you and I love you as an extension of me. And modern, modern man, the modern world in which we live, talks about rights and entitlements. What are you getting out of marriage? Uh, whereas Judaism says, not what are you getting, what are you giving to marriage? And we need to have that philosophy, that approach, that attitude. When you have two people who are looking to get something out of marriage, you'll have an unhappy marriage. When you have two people who are looking to give and put the other party first, make the other person happy, you'll have two happy people for the most part. So there definitely is an increase. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and, and again, Nachi's not here, so I'm allowed to be long-winded. He's, <laughs> he's the only one who told me to be uh, shorter with my, with my answers. You can too. Um, but the last thing I'll say is, I think I was talking to a couple of friends of mine, prominent uh, rabbi therapists, who are trying to create a campaign and a movement for all couples to have premarital counseling. That Rabbanim should not agree to be Masada Kedushin. A rabbi should not officiate at a wedding unless the couple has gone for three sessions before the wedding and one session after the wedding, but only six weeks after the wedding. Meaning three sessions before to be realistic about marriage, to understand marriage, to understand men and women, to understand what it means to, to live together. And then be married, but you can't go to that fourth session when you're in the honeymoon and I love them, they're perfect, they can do no wrong. You got to wait till you had your first fight. And then you go to that fourth session and there'll be no stigma attached because if we make it the standard and we ask everyone to do it, we can remove the stigma. And the best thing we can do is to create healthier marriages before they're in crisis, to take good marriages and make them great before they go into crisis. Wow. Okay, that's an incredible answer and an incredible initiative. Thank you on behalf of uh, Mimi Fulmini and Klai, so. Um Okay, so a couple of questions coming in. This is, this is actually related to, the Rav had a very interesting point there about don't make anything uh, life-altering, any decisions life-altering during COVID and, and this crazy time. So one of the questions transitioning to Rosh Hashanah is we're in lockdown. This is Lee Berman, 28. We're in lockdown over Rosh Hashanah. What can I do to celebrate on my own COVID Rosh Hashanah that is a great question. That is a sad question. Our heart goes out to you. There are people in parts of the world who are still locked down and precluded from being one another. There are people all over the world because they're particularly vulnerable at risk who are voluntarily locked down and can't be with others. And our hearts go out to you and we dive in for you and uh, we're sad for you that that's your, that's your matzah, that's your situation. But the best thing I can say as an outsider who's not experiencing it, so to a certain degree, I don't have a right to, but I can only tell you what I've tried to do in the earlier parts of the corona when we experienced that lockdown was to realize and to remember, this is where Hashem wants me. It's not that I wish I were in shul and I can't believe I'm being denied and deprived of the opportunity to be with others and there's no chazan and there's no hundreds or thousands of people and the walls are shaking and that's where I want to be. So I'll, I'll in fact forfeit my entire Rosh Hashanah and I won't experience it because I'll just spend it wishing I was somewhere else. Instead, embrace where you are, lean into where you are, and recognize and realize it's where you're meant to be. And how do I know it's where you're meant to be? How can I make such a bold statement? Because that's where you are. And if that's where you are, that's where Hashem meant for you to be. And so instead of um, being envious or anxious or angry that you're not with others, lean into that experience. There's a great story of, of the Rebbe of Zusha and uh, with his brother, and there's a whole story in the prison, in the bucket, and they couldn't have, and, and they were dancing because that was their situation. So the guard took the bucket with the excrement, and each one, as long as you continue to remember that that's where you're meant to be, you can sing and dance with that. So again, it's harder said than done, and I don't need to minimize the challenge or struggle of being alone, but you have an opportunity you don't normally have. You're the chazan, and you're the rabbi, and you're the gabbai, and you're the baltokeya, and you're it all. So, you know, some of us, you know, like to think that we're the chazim when we're in the shower, when we're all alone, we want to compete, and we, don't, we think the shul doesn't know what it's missing out by not having us. This is our chance to shine. This is our chance not to be a spectator and rely on others for inspiration. This is your year to create and generate the inspiration because there is nowhere else to turn. And sometimes, sometimes we dig deepest into ourselves, and sometimes we become our best selves when we remember there's nowhere else to turn, and it's entirely up to us. Like Rabbi Lazar ben Durdaya, it's a whole... Gamara for another time. Amazing. I'm definitely a, a shower cousin. <laughs> um, and also, this is probably something throughout the year, not only a Rosh Hashanah specific thing, but to realize whatever circumstance it w goes differently than you expected, the flight didn't work out, that whatever, like this is exactly where Hashem wants you to be and make the best of it. Exactly. By the way, it's not just true for people in lockdown. I think we talked about it last time, two times ago. There are, there are mothers of young children 
who wish they could be in shul like in their seminary days, but now they're in a different role in life. There are, there are incapacitated men and women who health doesn't allow them to, to be there or to be there the entire time for davening. And so I think it's really important to, as hard as it is, not to, again, forfeit the moment by trying to be somewhere we can't, but to be fully present in where we are and make the most of that moment. Amazing. Thank you, Rob. Another question related to Rosh Hashanah, a coming time, it's, it's about tshuva. It says, why do we take tshuva seriously during these times, El Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and not the rest of the year? It's a, that's a great question. It's a great question because tshuva is relevant the whole year. In fact, somebody texted me earlier today. They're learning uh, Rav Cook's uh, Sefer Oros HaTshuva. Rav Weinberger, Rav Moshe Weinberger has a magnificent uh, commentary translated into English. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. And, Three volumes. Yeah, and in Rav Cook's right. HaTshuva, so much of it is about how tshuva is not relegated or limited to this time of year. It's not like you can't do tshuva other than this time of year in Elul and Tishrei. The whole year, the whole year you made a mistake, the whole year you came up short, the whole year you hurt another person or you violated the relationship, the trust with Hashem, we can do tshuva. We can do that repair. Tshuva is one of the things that was created, the Gemara tells us, before the world was created. It's on the list of things that were created before the days of creation. You know what that tells me? Whenever I think about that Gemara, I realize God did not create a utopian society. God did not have an expectation that we were going to be perfect. He built into creation that we're fallible. He built in he comes into the relationship with an expectation that there will be mistakes, and he already plants within it the way out. He tells us, there's, before I created the whole world, there's tshuva. Some suggest that's why the bride, the, the, the chassan under the chuppah with his kala, that's why he breaks the glass. Before you leave the chuppah, you break the glass. That's not so romantic. What are you doing? So some suggest, in addition to all the classic reasons, in addition to the worst Jewish joke, it's the last time he's putting his foot down, but some suggest the reason you're breaking the glass is to remember that you're about to leave this majestic, magical moment of your chuppah, things break. Let's break the first thing right here before we even leave so that we can remember when you go home, things are going to break. Things will break. There'll be broken moments. There'll be broken objects. Things will break. So Hashem understands that we'll feel broken and we'll live broken lives at times. And He created and built tshuva in before He even created the world. So we can and must do tshuva all year round. However, so why then do we have it? Is this whole thing like a joke? We have all of this, all these things as catalysts to stimulate our doing tshuva. And you know, like the clock is ticking. It's going to be Yom Kippur. It's going to be Ni'ilah. It's going to be Yoshana Rabbah. And the answer is that, you know, we are a great group of procrastinators. And if we didn't have a deadline and a timeline, we likely wouldn't do it. So even though we can and should do tshuva all year round whenever we need it, but we created a calendar with a timeline and deadline so that we would be moved to actually do it. So we'd be moved to take it seriously, to embrace it and to get it done. To take it from, um, I think it was on Meaningful Minute, just shared a clip. Was it Meaningful Minute? Maybe somebody else. Uh, Rabbi Sachs, Lord Sachs, Zichron Levracha, who talked about, you know, Stephen Covey has their four quadrants, important and urgent and so on and so forth. So often the important gets buried because the urgent always takes precedent. And we never get to the important. Chuba is important, but who has time for it? You got to pay tuition. You got to shop for kosher food. You got to work. You got to survive Corona. Who has time for tshuva? So the calendar comes and it forces us to address not only the urgent, but it forces us to also address the important. Amazing. So we should do it all year. Don't just wait to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. But if you just relegated it to the important file, but not urgent, now it's both important and urgent. Exactly. So let's get on it. Amazing. Exactly. Okay. Another question. This is about the Simonim on Rosh Hashanah, and it says, it seems, it seems superficial. I eat the head of the fish, and I'm going to be at the head. My year is going to be at the head of the line. It's going to be successful. What's going on with the Simonim? We don't do this on other Yom and Tovim. So how is eating the head of the fish, or, you know, different people have different cute apples uh, and yeah. and the Gemara says simani mosa. Yeah. The Gemara says specifically when it comes, which is very peculiar, because on the one hand, we're people who don't believe in superstition. We're not supposed to believe in superstition. Some of us do, but we're not supposed to. Hashem took us out of Egypt. Egypt was a place of superstition, horoscope, superstition, magic. And God said, you don't need any of that Narish kite. You have me. Drop all of that. All you need is me. You have me. And some people continue to follow it. I won't give examples because I don't want people to drop off. I don't want to offend anybody. But they're all silly superstitions that, 
the Tosefta calls Darche Amori, calls it uh, idolatry, which have seeped their way into, made their way into the Jewish people. So we don't believe in superstition. And yet Rosh Hashanah comes along, and the same people who rail against all of these superstitions we're not supposed to do, and all of a sudden we're dipping apple in honey, and we're eating the carrots, and we're eating the fenugreek, and we're eating the leek, and we're eating the head of the fish, and we're eating the head of what's going on. So the difference is that that's not superstition. That sources itself back to the Gemara itself. And the Gemara says, Simon and Milsa, when it comes to Simonim, when it comes to symbols, they have value. Here's the thing. If you subscribe to the symbols as superstition, they have no value. That's idolatry. It's magic. But if the symbols are only symbolic, and the Rishonim say this, the commentators in the Gemara say this, if the symbols motivate you to remember certain themes and to turn to God and to invest in God and to submit and surrender to God, so the symbols are there just to jar us, to jog us, to, to, to stimulate us to connect to Him. They're symbols. They're meant to only be symbols. If they're superstitions, if I wear this red string around my wrist, nothing bad will happen. If I eat the head of the fish, I'm going to come and be the top of the class. If I eat the that, then the, the, it doesn't work that way. I don't believe in a God like that. I could, I could misbehave. I could be cruel, insensitive, unkind, cheat, steal. And then I just have to eat the head of the fish. Psh, gonna have a great year. We don't believe in superstitions. It's not Ashkai. We don't believe in that. What we believe is that we look at these symbols and the symbols remind us of what's important. The symbols remind us that we turn to God in order to achieve those things. So it's all a question of how we, of how we use those symbols. Do the symbols become a superstition? Or are the symbols a source of connecting to God? Amazing. I forgot to give my disclaimer that even though yeah. this is a question, I don't have all the answers. These are just my thoughts. But I invite everybody, whether it's tonight or if we continue, when we continue, you know, ask whatever questions you have. I'd love to talk about whatever topics, controversial, not controversial in the bigger Jewish world. If people don't have an opportunity to, to talk to their rabbi or rabbis often, again, I don't have all the answers. I'm not an authority, but I'm more than happy to try to address uh, anything and anything. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's already been a couple of questions coming in about the first part about the divorce. Um, a bunch is it based on, are we not trying hard enough or are we not equipped enough? Um, and maybe that speaks to the, the Rav's initiative um, right at the beginning. Maybe it is, or forget about me. What would Rav say? Is it that we're not trying enough is it, or, or is we're not equipped enough? of why marriages are, are falling apart, they're dissolving. I think there are a lot of um, factors and variables. Again, this is all anecdotal. I'm not a therapist, I'm not a mental health professional, and I don't have research and studies, but I do do a fair amount of marriage counseling. And um, I think there are a lot of variables and factors. I think we're living in a crazy world, an anxious world. We're living in a world which is uh, hedonistic and morally depraved in some ways, which is harder to protect the sanctity of marriage. We're living in a world which doesn't respect the sanctity of marriage. Marriage is no longer a virtue. Some consider marriage a vice. And you see couples, even couples who are together, don't bother with that piece of paper called marriage and different definitions of marriage. So there's an assault on marriage as an institution, and that has an impact. Um, the pressures that we live with, you know, what the average person lives with from when they wake up in the morning until they go to sleep at night, the pressure to produce, the pressure to bring home the income, the pressure to live morally in a world which is enticing and inviting us to do immoral things, all of that places enormous, enormous pressure on us. So I think that there are a lot of variables that are contributing to the pressure and stress on marriage. Um, in some cases, if people tried harder, if they had a spirit of compromise and sacrifice and selflessness, if people were willing to give and not just take, if people put in the work of marriage, probably some of those marriages could be saved and preserved. In other cases, people legitimately have grown apart. They're in different directions. Is it reconcilable? There are violations of trust that took place in which the marriages couldn't be saved. So I don't think it's an easy answer, but I do think that we should teach much more and instruct more about healthy marriages. I think, as we spoke about earlier, we should encourage premarital counseling and, and try to address and solve some of the challenges before they turn into the level of crisis. Sometimes once it spirals to crisis, it's hard to come back and recover. But if we can catch it before it gets there, we have a better shot. Okay. And one more thing on, on the relationship thing. Romance. Rob mentioned something about things that are romantic, the, the breaking of the glass. But is romance uh, a Torah concept? Should there be romance in our, in our intimate relationships? Yeah, that's a great question. So romance, it depends how you're using or translating the word romance. Um, but I would say romance can mean affection. And absolutely, it's not only a Jewish concept, it's a Jewish contract. If anyone ever bothered translating the Ksuba, the marriage document, you will find that 
the contract between the husband and the wife is a responsibility to allocate time, allocate resources, allocate love, allocate affection. There is a responsibility to, to make a commitment of time. Ona is time. There has to be a physical affection, physical intimacy, spiritual and emotional intimacy and affection. If you ask me, it's one of the biggest crises of our day. You want to try to get some more viewers here and, and turn this a little bit different rating. We're at 920 at night. So, you know, I don't know uh, what rating this is on, on Instagram Live. Um, but I think one of the biggest crises going on right now in the greater world, the Jewish world, including the Torah world, are issues of intimacy in marriage. Mismatched libidos, um, moral boundaries, um, issues of being under enormous pressure and not having the physical or emotional strength to invest in meaningful time, meaningful conversations, to confide and trust physically, to experience intimacy, closeness, connection, the way the Torah meant for that physical connection to be. For the Torah, sexual pleasure, intimacy is not a concession. It's a value. It's, it's in the contract too. It's in the ksuba. There's a responsibility and an obligation, and it's not to procreate. Couples who are married or postmenopausal or uh, pregnant or postmenopausal uh, or, or unable to become pregnant also have a mitzvah of owner. They have an obligation because the act is not only to produce, uh, to procreate, the act is to produce closeness, connection, a feeling of intimacy, to have something that one shares with one other person, no one else in the world. When the Torah talks about uh, the sexual act, it calls it das. Adam yada es chava ishto. Man knew his wife chava. Why don't we have another word, aside from the fact that the Torah is very strict to preserve a sense of sanctity, but because intimacy is the ultimate, you're, you're exposed to someone in the most literal sense you're exposing yourself. And you're experiencing something that you reserve to only experience with them. Nobody else knows, nobody else is, nobody else is present, nobody else shares that experience. It's unique and it's direct and it's intimate. So I think that there are a lot of marriages, you know, connecting these ideas. There are marriages that are floundering and in crisis, um, even if they have all the ingredients to be a healthy marriage that can continue because there are crises of intimacy. There, there are failures of husbands and wives not communicating what their needs are, not communicating that if they cannot get on the same page, what those consequences and what the dangers might be in acting out and why it's so important to solve that and to heal that and to address that. And there are a lot of ways that that, manifests itself and needs to be done. So I think that historically, out of a sense of modesty, we've shied away from talking about these kinds of things. So you don't have public shiurim, you don't even have online, I don't think, a lot of public shiurim about these themes and these topics, but sexual pleasure, sexual intimacy, romance, affection, it's considered to be something that should be communicated in private. And of course, that's a huge value of ours. But the problem is that there are people everywhere wondering, struggling, are they alone? Do other people go through this? Um, are they normal? Is what's happening in their marriage normal? And they have no one to communicate. They're afraid, they're intimate, or they've been shut down from communicating it with their spouse. And therefore, um, they maybe act out, or they feel depressed, or they feel unworthy, or they become addicted to certain behaviors. And there's a real, real crisis of this. And I think that we need to bring it out in the open, not in an immodest or unhealthy way, in appropriate way, but in a way that we take away some stigma, we have some conversation, that's part of the premarital counseling, is to talk about that component of marriage, not just the chosen shmuz and the kala shmuz, which are important for the hashkafa of it, but also to take away the stigma for what needs to be spoken about it. How we got on this, I don't even know. I don't know either, but, but this is real. This is real talk. The, this, the title of this series is Real Questions, Real Answers. And Oh, there's a whole lot more real where that comes from, but we'll keep it at that for now. Wow. Okay, I, anecdotally speaking, I have experienced a, a, a similar resistance because maybe it's because of educational techniques or whatever it is that there's sort of a shying away from these type of topics. And then when somebody wa feels like they're struggling, there isn't a lot to turn to uh, in a healthy way, at least. And it's probably more widespread than, than just you know, most people think that they're struggling just alone. And thank you, Rob, for bringing it out into a, a public Big forum. And hopefully, I'll tell you one one thing we we tried to do several years ago here at BRS, but it's not it's not online. You can't find it. Is with a recognition that it'd be inappropriate to have a public forum where you'd have a talk on this with husbands and wives. That would, by definition, be violating our boundaries. But yet, on the other hand, how are you going to address it? So I did a series with a local therapist with a confidential um, conference call number. Husbands and wives could call in together 
all of those who call in would be confidential and anonymous to one another. Nobody knew who else was there. And the therapist and I had a very, um, a very transparent and a very direct and very graphic discussion about halakhically what's permissible and forbidden within the bedroom and within these practices, and also addressing some of these questions of crises within intimacy, within marriage, within affection, within romance, what's normal, what's acceptable, what's healthy, what's unhealthy, what should be expected, how do you navigate, how do you negotiate, how do you communicate these things? And it had a wonderful, wonderful response. There were a lot of people who participated and there's a big need for it. And it's, it's being unspoken and not addressed, but it is, it is a real crisis. What else we got? What other questions? Okay, we have a whole bunch more, a whole bunch more running out of time. Um, so this one is moving on to a more philosophical uh, Kantian type dilemma. So when should, this is based on, on an event that happened this week, when should a necessary military strike be called off if there may be civilian casualties? Wow. <laughs> I didn't see that coming, following up on the romance question. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a sharp pivot. It's a big halacha question. Um, nobody's more sensitive to that question. There's no more moral army in the world than the Holy Israel Defense Force, the IDF. And, um, and they, with the chief rabbinate of the IDF, and of course internally, have that debate all the time. And, and it's a big question because if you have a tar terrorist in your target, and if you take that terrorist out, you could be saving Israeli lives, or in this case, American lives. On the other hand, you might take out, you might take out civilians with that terrorist, so what, what are the moral boundaries? What's right? Do you put the civilian lives ahead of... Uh, I'll give you another example. And this has been a huge, huge controversy with the IDF going into Gaza. If the IDF um, were to strike only from the sky in Gaza, we wouldn't lose one life. We wouldn't risk one soldier. But we'd have a lot more civilian casualties. So should the IDF go in on the ground when they need to, though it's a risk to our own soldiers in order to protect civilians? Or do you say our soldiers' lives come first and if there are terrorists using the civilian as shields, then that's on the terrorists. So we have Torah sources. We have a Torah source that goes back to the story of uh, Shimon and Levi, when they defend their sister. Their sister is uh, Dina, is taken captive and raped, and they go and they wipe out the entire people of Shechem. And there's a big discussion of um, what were the moral, what are the ethics and the morality of civilian casualties, collective punishment. What did what they do wrong when they took out the people of Shechem? So the Maharal, in his commentary on Rashi, called Gur Aryeh, he says, the whole institution of war. What right do you have when you serve in the army to shoot someone on the other side? You're in a battle. I don't understand. The Torah says murder is forbidden. Murder is a cardinal sin. Why isn't that murder? Now, just because someone declared it war, now when you shoot the person in the other uniform, now murder became permissible? So when is murder forbidden? When is murder permissible? And the answer is, Judaism recognizes, the Torah recognizes something called war. In the context of war, there's going to be loss of life. To defend yourself, you're allowed to. And in, in the context of war, and this is what the Maharal answers, that Shimon and Levi did nothing wrong by killing all the people of Shechem, because when it's in the context of a war, civilian casualties will happen. Civilian casualties will happen. So you can never entirely avoid civilian casualties. They're part of every war, and they're part of the morals of war. So a person has to have a strong moral compass, ask halacha guidance, be guided by the Torah and its principles. But even within the Torah, there are circumstances where there may be civilian casualties, but in order to win that war and protect our people, that is a price that has to be paid. I think we have uh, time maybe only for one, one more quick yeah. one. One more, one more quick one. There are a whole bunch of comments coming in. Now that the Rebbe mentioned the comments, I'm seeing them. And there's a whole bunch that want to know, could they get information towards this anonymous hotline course about intimacy um is there is there a way to access that information or we, yeah we did it several years ago i did two sessions with the therapist intentionally it was not recorded and put up online because um we were able to speak more freely that way it was direct for the people listening who were anonymous and confidential one to another but it sounds like there's an interest and a need to do it again you know i, I avoided continuing it and doing it again i'll just admit here on a meaningful minute because I didn't want to become pigeonholed as that rabbi. Oh, that's the rabbi who talks about that all the time. I like to talk about a lot of things. Maybe now that we've done three question and answers on other things, it's time to be able to do something. I would never do it on an Instagram Live or Facebook Live or anything like that. I think it belongs in a much more modest, private, confidential way, but giving people access uh, to it. 
Okay, so the last question is, Meaningful Minute has quotes that they put up every day, different quotes from mostly contemporary Rabbanim and Rabbi Goldberg is one of the premier quoted fellows, uh, or G'dayl. And one of the quotes is, we cannot control what knocks, but we absolutely can control what we let in and when. And the question is, perhaps the, the Rav could elaborate on this idea. Sure, fantastic. It's a, it's a great way to go out. Take it home. Um, I, I read that in the Sefer once as quoting a Hasidic story. It was quoting, it was, it was actually, it's relevant to the other topic we were just talking about. You're a healthy, vibrant man. You're walking down the street. There is a beautiful um, woman who's scantily clad and you are tempted to look, to gaze, and for your mind to race. So what does the Torah hold us accountable for? So there are svarim, there are Kabbalistic svarim that say that Hashem, God, the Almighty, holds us accountable if we perseverate or marinate on the thought, if we fantasize or allow ourselves to think. But the very fact that we noticed is a reflection of being healthy that we're not accountable for. And in that Sefer, it sold the following story about the Hasid, the Hasid. There was a Hasid who was at night panicking. He was having all kinds of thoughts, thoughts of fear, anxiety, worry about Parnassah, thoughts about other women, thoughts about... His thoughts were, were owning him. They were gripping him. They were paralyzing him. So what does a good chassid do? He goes to the home of his Rebbe. He knocks on the door of his Rebbe. There's no answer. So he bangs louder and there's no answer. So he goes around to the side and he looks through the window and he sees his Rebbe sitting at the table learning. So he starts to bang on the window frantically for the Rebbe to look up and to answer. He doesn't even look up. He doesn't answer. The next morning, the chassid goes to shul and he finds his Rebbe. And after Davin, he says, Rebbe, I needed you last night. And the Rebbe says, I know. I know your question. I already gave you the answer. You know my question? What do you mean? I didn't even get to speak to you to let me in. So the Rebbe says, just like last night, you came to my home and you knocked and you tried to get in through the front door and then you tried to get in through the window. You knocked, but it was up to me let to, whether to let you in. Those thoughts can come knocking, but it's up to you whether you, they, you let them in or not. And I've used that as a tool for myself in life. When you have thoughts, when you have all kinds of thoughts on all kinds of subjects, those thoughts can knock. We're not accountable if they knock. We're not in control if they knock. Well, we are accountable. We are the gatekeepers. We are accountable for what we let in, for what we let in. And that's a good thought to have this time of year. Shoftim v'shotrim, titein l'chol v'chol sh'arecha. We have policemen and we have judges and we can decide. We're not accountable. It's very, it's very um, comforting. It's very comforting and empowering to not think I'm a terrible person because I have those thoughts. The thoughts knock. You're a healthy person if you have those thoughts. What we are in control of, what we're accountable for is not if we have the initial thought, but whether we let them in. It's been a pleasure to be with you again. I've got to run. I look Amazing. forward to next time. And I hope people will continue to expand the breadth of the kinds of questions and things we talk about. I'm enjoying it. I hope you are too. And people should know that it's on uh, Instagram. I don't even know how Instagram works. It's on the reel, the story. It's somewhere on Meaningful Minute. But these Lives are on the feed. And they're also on YouTube. So if you want to share it with somebody else who doesn't have access to Instagram, all the questions and answers are on YouTube as well on my page on uh, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg. Ksiv Chsim Atov, I should have a good Gabench Jor and a good Rosh Hashanah. Thank you so much for including me. Thank you so much, Rabbi. All the best. Ksiv Chsim Atov. Thank you everyone for joining us and watching. And have a wonderful rest of your evening.